Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Our last speaker for today's weekend webinar is the District Division Director, Kelvin Chen, an accomplished retailer in projects and a trusted advisor in property investments with a degree in business management and the years of experience in consumer and the corporate banking. Kelvin has a well honed foresight to the economic market and his success as a real estate agent gives him the added value of combining his industry knowledge with his financial background. Today, he's going to share with you, uh, with you three essentials to take advantage and uh, stay ahead in investing your next property. During the sharing, do leave your questions in the Q&A box, if any. We will answer it accordingly. Now I'm going to hand over the mic to Kelvin. Kelvin, here you are. Thank you, Wendy. Hi, everyone. A very good afternoon. You know, on a lovely, wet, uh, rainy Saturday. Uh, my name is uh, Kelvin again, once again. I'm the District Division Director with ERA Singapore. 2020 marks my seventh year in the real estate industry. Prior to that, I was working in the banking industry, dealing with consumer and corporate banking. My property investment journey started about 14 years ago when I first bought my private property at the age of 25. Being born and raised up in a one-room HDB flat and also being the eldest son in a family has indirectly shaped me to be a more conservative person when it comes to risk taking. So I do weigh up the risks and rewards carefully before making any investment decision. So I truly understand how many of us would feel when it comes to purchasing or investing in property. So today, I will be sharing with everyone the three key essentials that you could take advantage in today's environment so that you could stay ahead in your property journey. If you find me familiar, yes, I did appear in a couple of newspaper articles and I'm also invited as a guest speaker in a banking event. I'm currently still doing sales, managing my client's property portfolio, and at the same time, leading my own team of associates under this elite division, where we caught more than half a billion worth of transaction in 2019. I'm currently also a trainer in my group, preeminent group, where I do teach realtors about property wealth creation. So these are some of my highlights of my earlier introduction. Before we begin, here is the disclaimer. This afternoon presentation is of my own opinion, based on my experience and of course the data collected and analyzed which is shared uh, with you guys later. While I had endeavored the information collected to be as accurate and relevant in today's environment, it is also advisable for listeners out there to do your own due diligence you know, before you make any property uh, investment decision or purchase. So without further ado, I shall start my today's session. So let me begin with a story. All right. A group of villagers went to the forest you know, so that they could reach the river at the other side for their water source. Now halfway through their journey, they spotted this tiger looking ferociously at them. You know, the tiger looks very hungry as it seems that he has not been eaten for days. And unfortunately, the tiger also spotted them. And now, the tiger slowly approached them and all of a sudden, start running towards them. So, if you are one of the villagers over there, what would you do? Would you stay where you are and pretend it? Or, you run away as fast as you can. If, if I were you, I will quickly assess the environment and then make sure I run faster than the last person, <laughs> right? So that I will not be eaten up and I will still be able to stay alive. And then I will run towards the nearest escape route for safety. I will definitely bring with me you know, with the right tools and more people back into the forest and make sure that I kill the tiger because the tiger, if it's still alive, it will always remain a threat to the villagers. Why do you think I would like to share with you this story? 
Right, so basically, this is the same story that Minister Chan shared with us, you know, way back in 2017, which is about three years ago. All right. This is how, he shared with us, this is how Singapore would react when we face a crisis. Because when we face a crisis or a recession, all right, I think most, most everybody will be affected. All right, but how? You know, when we face a crisis, say for example, a region, say Southeast Asia region or Asia Pac region or Kobo, where all countries are affected, how Singapore could react to be the least affected, all right, among everyone, so that you know, once we are least affected, we are better off. And when we are better off, we also want to position ourselves to stay ahead, you know, of our all our friendly competitor to make sure that we can take advantage of the impending recovery. Well, I mean, of course, crisis will pass, all right? So recovery will come. So how can we then, you know, be at the forefront to take advantage, all right, of the impending recovery? So what's the moral of the story? Of course, the moral of the story is to be the least affected, all right, in times of crisis and position yourself to stay ahead when an opportunity arises. So right now, of course, we are facing this coronavirus you know, pandemic. It is a global event. Of course, we have seen how Singapore reacted and try to stay as least affected, you know, during this whole period. Of course, we did experience, you know, the second wave. And I think we kind of like did a very good job as we seen how some of the country, you know, when they were hit by the second wave, how they have handled the situation. I think as a whole, Singapore has handled the situation very well. Right. And if you have seen the news yesterday, or rather a couple of uh, two days ago, we are already slowly you know, opening up our economy. We reported better uh, growth rate. We, we actually opening up for visitors from Australia, from China, for example, you know, to come in and visit us, you know, to spend some money into the Singapore. So this goes to show that you know, Singapore is well positioned. You know, to be the first few countries to open up, then how can you, as a Singaporean or as an investor, take advantage of all this? You know, in crises like this, there's always danger for sure. But the difference of being able to stay ahead is where you can actually find opportunity amidst all the danger. All right. So it is always important, all right, to be the least affected at the same time, to stay ahead when an opportunity arises. So when was the last global crisis that we faced or Singapore faced? Right, of course, the most recent last global event that the whole world has faced is basically the global uh, recession. All right? And of course, it started like almost 12 years ago already. Right, time flies. Right, so that particular year, all right, I'm, also, I'm only three years into the mind banking industry. So I, I was really very worried then because I'm not knowing what to do. But from now, of course, we can actually draw our experience, you know, and how we actually pass through this particular global event. Right? So back to this global event, all right, what happens? Lehman Brothers, 100 over years of history, all right, just collapsed overnight. Merrill Lynch, nearly as well. AIG, I still remember the stock prices was almost as low as a dollar. All right, so what did you know, the US Fed did and what did the government did as well? Of course, no one would just stay where they are and pretend they, right? Every you know, uh, government in the country would try to have some stimulus package to support their own economy. Likewise for the US Federal Reserve. So of course, things are better already. But basically, they have analyzed the three or rather the main tactics that were being used all right, to counter this global uh, recession. All right, so what happens is that they basically use the main two things like interest rates and of course, the quantitative easing. Quantitative easing has impact, definitely has impact into this uh, economy. And I would like to point out what sort of impact it has you know, on our Singapore property price. And of course, as you can see, this is a last 15 years of a property price index graph. 
All right, subprime crisis happened somewhere around quarter one, quarter two of 2008. All right, as you can see, the prices falls quite dramatically. All right, within one quarter, it can drop by more than 10%. That is quite a steep drop. Now, of course, what happens is that the quantitative easing came in the QE1 of 1.5 trillion tranche, right, being you know, um, pumped into the economy, pumped into the system. And Singapore being a very open economy, having this open housing uh, economy thing, uh, of course, we do get some effect on these QE measures. So what happens is that we, you know, when the QE1 was introduced in December 2008, we experienced our bottoming in Q1 2009, or rather Q2 2009. All right, so from then on, you can see from the second quarter to the third quarter, there was a massive jump, all right, of more than 10% per quarter, all right? So it was really, you know, having a very much positive impact. Within a year, as you can see, it has surpassed, you know, the pre-subprime crisis uh, days, all right? Of course, there is a second tranche where we call it the QE2, 600 billion starting from November 2010. And of course, the QE3, 600 billion again, you know, starting from September 2012 to October 2014. So what happens is that, as we can see, QE do have a positive impact on this local property price index. From the first QE right, to second quarter 2011, we have a positive price growth of 52%. All right, and for second quarter to second quarter 2014, we have a positive effect of 62% price growth. But what we can realize is that the price growth is kind of like being tapered. Why is it being tapered? Because of the cooling measure, right? If you can remember, the first cooling measure that was introduced in today's market is back in 10 years ago already. That's how time flies. All right, first cooling measure 20 of February 2010, and the and the implementation of this ABSD is actually implemented 8th of December 2011. I would say ABSD is somewhat of like a, you know, like a, a wealth tax where you know, the government introduced additional tax for more properties that you purchase. All right. So of course, as you can see, you see that per quarter rate growth starts to slow down as a string of cooling measures being introduced. And I think the final nail to the coffin then was the introduction of total debt servicing ratio. I think that has an impact you know, on the property market as a whole. And this cooling measure still continues even till today. All right, later on, we'll investigate a little bit more on TDSR. But I want to let you see that the QE do have a positive impact, a positive effect on Singapore property prices. And when it comes to this coronavirus, the Federal Reserve has started its QE measures as well. All right, it started in end March 2020 this year. And I think I want to point out to you the key word here is unlimited. It's not 600 billion. It's not 1.5 trillion. It's more than that. It's unlimited. So the next question for us is whether will we have another positive effect on the local property price? All right, of course, whether you can call it coincident or not, you know, the last quarter, the last two quarters we have seen, all right, property price index has went up, you know, 0.1%, sorry, 0.3% on second quarter. 2020, and of course, 0.8% uh, for quarter three 2020. All right, so it does have a positive impact, but I would like to point out that, you know, uh, there are still travel restrictions in place. I don't think we have seen the full effect of this quantitative easing yet. All right, and the other thing I want to point out is on the interest rate. All right, interest rate cuts, as we all know, right now, it's cut to zero, meaning that you know, if you want to put in your money over here, all right, you probably receive zero, zero interest or, or close to zero interest. I think if you want to borrow, then you'll be borrowing at a very low interest rate environment. So it means that if today you are a borrower, it does benefit you. And if you are a saver, definitely you lose this out. And one of the reasons why the Fed cut rates to zero is to encourage borrowing 
right? So as to be able to stimulate the economy, how, right? So that firstly, right, you can actually borrow money to what to um uh, help your businesses, for example, all right? Or you know, if your businesses is already facing some form of a crisis, then the loan repayment can't be, you know, at a at a very high rate. You know, so a low rate will help to ease off some of the cash flow. So as you can see, you know, the pre-subprime day, the interest rate then was about 5%. You know, in the last 10 years or so, we have experienced very low interest rate. If you have invested or if you have refinanced your packages, you know, last year or the year slightly towards the end of 2018, you'll realize that towards the end of 2018, 2019, all right, the interest rate is actually hovering above 2%. But right now, of course, we all know that it's definitely below 2%, all right? So it's actually uh, pretty low. But I want to share with you what is the positive impact of having a low interest rate when you borrow and then you invest in a property or an asset that can appreciate in the future, all right? So low interest rate, for example, if you want to take a 1 million loan at a 30 years loan tenure, all right, I have done up a table for you. All right, so basically, if it's at 1% interest rate, your monthly repayment is at 3,216. So therefore, your annual value, sorry, your annual repayment amount will be 38,592. Right, if it's at 1.5, then the annual repayment is 41,000, additional 3,000 more. And of course, all the way up to 3.5% when I done up in this table, it shows that it's 53,000. 880. So in this table, it is very clear that, of course, low interest rate means lower monthly repayment. High interest rate means high monthly repayment. But I just want to share with you a little bit more. Is it just this? All right. Is it just only this particular information that you need to know? All right. Low interest rate, low monthly repayment. High interest rate, high monthly repayment. Is it something more than that that you need to know, right? Yes, okay? You have to understand, monthly installment equals to servicing the principal repayment plus the interest payable, all right? It breaks down into two parts, interest payable plus principal repayment, right? Take for example, if today the interest rate is at 1%, all right? Your annual repayment is 38,592. Do you know that only 25.6% of this amount goes to servicing the interest? All right, but a large portion of it, 74.4%, goes to reducing the principal repayment. All right, that means you have a low interest. All right, a bigger portion of it goes to servicing the principal repayment. Let us take a look at if it's at 1.5%. From 744 it becomes 64.2%. So you can see, if today at 1%, at the end of the first year, my outstanding principal is $971,272. But if my interest rate is at 1.5%, I'm paying a higher monthly installment, but yet my outstanding principal at the end of the first year is higher. It's at $973,000. So, you have to understand, if today the interest rate is at 3.5% as shown in this table, right, there is kind of like a reversal in terms of the percentage. 64% right? goes to servicing the interest and it becomes 35, only 35% 35 servicing the principal repayment. Right? So there is a difference when the interest rate is low, not just by paying a lower monthly installment, but also it goes to show you that you can actually service a more portion of the principal amount so that you can reduce your outstanding faster. All right. So this is a very critical information that I want to let you know. You see, today you are paying more. Let's say, for example, if it's at 1%, you're paying at 38,592. But if it's at 3.5%, it's 53,000. If I break it down, you can see that 64, which is 64%, which is equivalent to 34,000 are almost the same amount that you are paying if it's 1%. And yet, all this goes to interest payment, all right? So this is important uh, information for you. And I want to let you know that low interest rate environment only happens 
when there is a recession or where there is a crisis. And if you want the economy to do well, you won't be able to enjoy a low interest rate. So this is something that you need to understand. And this is, you can only take advantage when the economy is not doing well. So this, the good news is that you can still enjoy low interest rate probably till 2023. That's what the Fed has mentioned, right? But the bad news over here right now is what? That not everyone, right? Not everyone can take advantage of this low interest rate, all right? So it's not just about like you can give, you can, you can give interest rate, but there's also checks and balance, right? For investor or even for borrower, that there's a chance that you might not even be able to take advantage of this interest, low interest rate, all right? So... And on top of that, Singapore government has also introduced this Singapore cooling measure, TDSR, right? How can or how does this also checks and balance and how does this restrict you in terms of taking advantage of this low interest rate environment? All right, same table. All right? Of course, right now, we all know that the interest rate is somewhat between 1.2% to maybe about 1.4%. So for easier calculation, let us just put it as 1.5%. Right? So if today I want to borrow a 1 million loan at 1.5%, I'll be paying a monthly repayment at $3,451. All right. So in order to qualify, it's the 60% TDSR, right? The TDSR ratio. Does it mean that the minimum income for me to qualify for a 1 million loan at 30 years loan tenure I must be earning $5,752. All right, the answer is no. All right, basically based on our Singapore cooling measure, the TDSR, but other than the 60% total debt servicing ratio that you need to hit, all right, the government wants the bank, all right, not to use 1.5, which is the current interest rate to calculate the monthly installment, but rather they want you to make sure that you are able to afford the monthly installment when the interest rate is at 3.5%. Right? So what does that mean? Meaning you will need to qualify, you need to earn a minimum income of $7,484 in order to qualify for $1 million loan. All right? It is important. That means you need to be earning more. All right? So if as a person, right, earning $7,484 and if I have a loan commitment of $3,000, $451. What is my net income or rather disposable income that I have after loan repayment? It's actually at 4213 So I think this is a good substantial amount for anyone, I guess, to, to really last through the whole month and probably have some savings as well. All right. So for this particular cooling measure, TDSR, the government educate buyers out there to have financial prudence, all right? So take a look at this table. Assuming if it's based on the current interest rate, you will have a lesser income after loan repayment. So with this current set of measure, it means something. It means that, you know, the investor or the property buyers who take up a loan, they firstly have to have a high income in order to qualify. Secondly, they will have a much higher disposable income, all right? So in terms of over leveraging, I think for this portion, it's really quite safe. And at the same time, you, you will have more disposable income and probably you have more savings as well, all right? But what if today I have a car loan or any other personal loan, say for example, all right? Just now the earlier example, we put it as person A. What if person B has a car loan of 1002, which is quite common? All right, so assuming today you have a car loan of 1002, all right, the total loan commitment is higher, all right, and then you take a look at the minimum income to qualify, it becomes 2000 more. With an additional of 1002, it becomes you need to earn 2000 more, all right. So then again, even after factoring the loan repayment, all your loan repayment, you still be having a higher disposable income. All right, so these are the financial prudence that the government wants right, when they introduce this cooling measure. All right? And not just that. Basically, the government also restrict the number of years that you can actually 
borrow for the bank loan. All right, you can only borrow 30 years or up to the age of 65 years old. What does this mean? All right, meaning that if today at the age of 35, all right, you don't have much time to really think about it. Why? Because if next year, when you turn 36 years old, you cannot borrow 30 years loan anymore. You can only borrow 29 years. So you have a shorter loan tenure. All right, when you have a shorter runway, means firstly, a higher monthly installment, that's one. Two, you need to be earning a higher income. And this, just to show you the minimum income to qualify, we have not even factored in any additional loans that you might have. For example, car loan, personal loan, or probably your kid's education loan or whatsoever. Right, so that means what? At the age of 40, you need to be earning at least 15.5% more in order to qualify for the same loan amount all right, as compared if today you are 35 years old. All right, it goes to show that you need to invest as young as possible. All right? The older you get, all right, the bank do not think that you are wiser, but rather you are closer to your retirement age. So therefore, they cannot lend you a longer loan tenure. This is important because the ability you know, to understand all this will allow you to stay ahead. All right? Because if you start investing only when you are age 40 versus your peers of 35 years old, right, there's kind of like a different outcome. When you invest in something with a low interest rate at a low interest rate environment versus a higher interest rate environment, your monthly installment is higher. All right? Your reducing of your principal is slower. So these are something that you really need to take advantage of in today's environment. All right? So if you really want to take advantage, are we in an oversupply situation or is there demand in our local private property market? So maybe let me um, zoom in a little bit more on the supply first. All right? Of course, we all know that where does supply comes from? All right? Typically, supply comes from M block. All right? Or government land sales, all right? Basically, how is the supply coming in from M block? Actually, since the introduction of the additional cooling measures in July 2018, the M block craze are basically kind of like disappeared, all right? So you, you didn't hear any M block sales, you know, happening from the second half of 2018. In fact, 2019, only five deals were con concluded. And out of the five deals, only two deals are the residential side. And in fact, for this year, there's only one deal. So what you can see is that M block supply, or rather the supply that is coming in from M block deals is really extremely low. All right. Secondly, the supply does come in from the government land sale because the government released land for sale so that you no know, developer can bid the land and build a new development to buy, I mean, to sell to uh, Singaporeans or investors. Because typically, there will always be this new launch, uh, demand for new launch, new, brand new developments, right? So when they introduce government land sales, they have these two portion called confirm lease and reserve lease. And we all know that under reserve lease, all right, it is only when the developer triggered the reserve price then it will be bring to the confirmed list in order to be released into the market. Otherwise, it will be forever in the reserve list. It will not be released in the market. All right, so in order not to confuse you, I will just cancel it out. I will just reflect only the confirmed list portion. All right, so this is the data stretches all the way back to 2012. So as you can see in 2012, non-EC private land, all right, the confirmed list is 8,120 units that will be supplied in the market. All right, EC will be 6,000. So the total private housing is 14,120. But do you know that the price, or rather the supply starts to streamline down or tapered down by at least half, all right, since 2014 onwards. So you can see 2014, it was about 7,009, 2015, 5,001. And in fact, 2019, all the way to 2019, all right, it continues to be tapered down in that sense, all right? And I want to point out to you specifically to 2020. Can you just take a look? 
all right, under the confirmed list for non-EC private land. All right, it's at 1,930. It is not even half of what is you know, being supplied into the market from 2014 to 2018. It's not even half. And in fact, it's not even 20% if you compare to 2012. So we are not in an oversupplying situation. In fact, M block sales, the supply from the M block sales is coming down. The supply from the government land sales is also coming down. What about the demand? Actually, the demand, if you have read the newspaper, you will realize that the demand you know, has been very high or rather quite high. Right? And we have recorded new private home sales hitting a more than two-year high right, in during this period of time, more than 1,000 per unit. Is it just on the primary market? All right, later on I will show you. Right? But you can see that there's a high demand of, for primary market. And if you look at the unsold supply, all right, firstly, the incoming supply is already very low. All right? The current supply at stock, all right, the unsold units are also reducing per quarter. As of third quarter 2020, as you can see, the total unsold, unsold unit is 28,727 units. And out of those, private stands out at 26,483. All right, if I drew a line over here, you'll realize that actually we are a lot closer to 2016 and 2017 mark as compared to, you know, the higher days of 2012s or even earlier than that. All right, so are we in an oversupply situation? Definitely, I think from this chart, it shows that we are not, all right? And is it just happening in the primary market? No, the secondary market, there's a lot of demand as well, all right? In fact, again, we have been hitting two years high, you know, averaging more than 1,000 units, all right, for the last three months as well. All right, so it goes to show that you know, on the newspaper article report, there's a high chance that private home price may end up positive by the end of the year. All right? And if you read the news closely, you'll realize that the demand is across the board, meaning primary home sales, secondary home sales, the resale market, and not just that, the CCR, the RCR region, the OCR region all experience high demand and not just the private segment, but at the same time, the HDB segment. So across the board, the demand is really, really very healthy. So that's why this is no surprise that, you know, recently, September 2020, UBS came up with this research report to say that Singapore real estate is fairly valued. You know, with the cooling measures in place, with the current stock that is available and the current demand that is, you know, going for, it is really, you know, fair value. There's a lot of balance fundamentals out there. All right. And I want to quickly point out to you is that, you know, prices has been up for the last two quarter. And if you compare for the whole year, all right, we are already 0.1% higher. If you compare since the bottoming out in second quarter 2017, we have experienced a price growth of 12.6%, which is if you, you know, uh, spread it out, it's about 1% per quarter. So it is not something that is for a sky high, but it's 1% per quarter, which is very realistic because it ties into with the economic indicators, the economic fundamentals. So I think this is, you know, definitely, as you can see from the UBS report, we are not in bubblish sector, all right? We are definitely in the fair value zone, all right? So and these are some of the breakdowns of the residential a price index on the change on quarter. And the other one I want to point out to you is that a rental demand is actually, the rental index is down, which is not surprising because of the travel restriction. All right. So with all this data, all right, how can you then be the least affected in during this crisis? All right, because everybody is affected, right? But how can you be the least affected? All right. And then you know, take advantage of what is available, or the environment, and to make sure that you can stay ahead, all right, when the opportunity arises. I mean, recovery will happen for sure. Right? So today, if you are excited and you want to know, okay, where is the, you know, uh, I want to make a purchase and where 
should I then invest in them? All right, the next few slides I will be sharing with you right, how possibly you can take advantage of this current uh, situation. All right, so of course, if you want to invest in a primary, uh, in, a, in a private residential market, you have two options. All right, one, of course, you go for the resale unit, which is the second hand market, or you go for the primary market, which is the new launch market, the brand new first hand. Right, both of course got pros and cons. All right, so if today you are someone who requires immediate homestay, and then maybe a resale would be probably more suitable. All right, because it gives you a shorter waiting time. All right, there's a lot of pros and cons. So maybe I will quickly touch on this. All right, if today, all right, uh, if you want to look at the resale, definitely one of the benefits of the resale market is that there is a lesser waiting time as I mentioned earlier because typically for a resale transaction it takes about three months to about four months to complete or maybe six months very rarely you see transaction completing in one year or more than a one year uh, period so typically it's about three to six months I would say so definitely a lesser waiting time as compared to brand new because brand new you will need to wait out for the three years or the four years construction period. All right, fair, unless you go for those new launch that is going to TOP soon. All right, the second benefit of going for resale is that you get to see the actual facing of the unit. All right, meaning that, okay, once you step into the house, all right, what is the view that I'm going to have? Is it the facilities view? Will there be any blockage of the view, for example, or the sea view or the greenery view or whatsoever? So these are the things that you can actually see. You do not need to just visualize from uh, visiting a show flat. You will know the actual view of the place. All right. And of course, and the other thing is that you can also know who is your immediate neighbors. All right. So these are the benefits of investing in resale uh, market. And of course, resale markets are typically having lower PSF. All right, I think this is not surprising me because we all know, right? For example, a brand new car versus a second-hand car, obviously the brand new car will cost higher. All right, likewise for a handphone, a brand new watch, all right, or a brand new bag versus a second-hand bag or brand new clothes. So, so I think you, you guys understand being brand new and uh, a second-hand um, items and things like that. So definitely for resale, you do have this lower PSF. All right. So what about the benefits of investing in new launches? All right. Of course, first thing first, new launches, it is brand new. All right. Not just the unit are new, but the whole development is new, meaning that the lease period, let's say for example, it's a 99 years leasehold. All right. Uh, even after factoring construction, period of three to four years probably, you still have a balance lease of 96 or 95 years. Right? So you definitely have quite a high balance lease as compared to the resale uh, development. All right? And the other thing is that you have more of a modern layout. All right? So maybe the architecture is more modern. You like the design, the facade of these new condos. Um, things uh, are, are you, the, the layout of the unit is more efficient. All right, basically, the design of the facilities are more modern, more things rather than a conventional swimming pool. For example, you have jacuzzi, you have spa pool, or you have aqua gym, for example. Right? So uh, facilities are more modern, all right? and layout are also more modern in that sense. And the good thing is that you know, typically when you go for a new launch, it's fully fitted. All right? There will be a brand new aircon for you. All right. Uh, the kitchen is typically fully furnished, fitted, all right, the bathroom as well. And it brings us to the next point where there is a defect liability period. So if you go for a new launch, you do have this one year warranty period, all right, that you uh, are rest assured to know that oh, there's some warranty to cover in case things are spoiled, for example. So you don't have this similar thing, you know, if you go for resale. And the other thing is that I want to let you know, for new launch, typically buyers, they will buy almost at the same entry price. All right. You won't have too much of a variance. All right. Unless you are talking about a different level or different facing and things like that. But typically in general, you will 
buying in at the same entry price, all right, as compared to resale unit. Because resale unit, for example, if it's a 20 years old development, you probably won't buy back at the same price of the first home buyer. Probably your pricing, it's maybe about the third buyer or the fourth time buyer. So when you want to resell it in the future, you will have a higher competition because the difference in your entry price. Right? So for new launch, you have a lesser worry on this. And of course, new launches are uh, in progressive payment schedule, meaning it's based on the construction progress, you pay according to that. All right? And of course, because it's under construction, all right, there's no property tax and no maintenance fee. All right, so basically, if today you are an investor, meaning your cash outlay all right, will be on the progressive mode and you have a lesser cash outlay. All right? So, and the other point I want to bring it out to you is that because you have a, a, a lower cash outlay, therefore, your, your break-even price will be lower. For example, all right, in this particular uh, slide, as you can see, you do not need to pay a property tax. All right? So you save on that. You do not need to pay the maintenance fee. So you save on that. And your interest rate is definitely lower because your monthly payment is based on the construction progress. And the other thing I want to point out is that for a new launch, even, un even up to the point where you collect the keys, you only pay up to 85% of the purchase price. The balance 15% is the part where, you know, where the developer get the CSE, then you will be required to release the balance 15%. So in terms of the cash outflow, as you can see, it's very much progressive. And it's very much slower. All right? the, the only same thing is that you get to enter the price right now. All right? Between new launch and resale, you enter the price right now. But in terms of the payment mode, it's all different. All right? So therefore, the total cost for new launch would be expected to be lower. So for example, for this case, you will have a lower break-even price. So if today, if you do not have an immediate need, all right, for uh, staying, right, maybe you can consider a new launch where you do not uh, need to worry about the rentability because right now the rental property index is down, right, due to the travel restriction. And so you do not need to worry about whether once you take over, can you rent it out or not or whether it takes a longer period of time to rent out. All right, so right now, and your payment schedule is on the progressive. All right, so today, assuming you want to go for a new launch, all right, as an investor, as a first-time investor, all right, where should you go? All right, which location should you consider? All right, so this is a map of Singapore. This is a map of Singapore. And as you can see, all right, we are divided into 28 different districts. All right, all of these 28 different districts, all right, what we call, we break down into further, is that there are core central region, all right, which is, of course, the Marina Bay, Tanjong Paga, you know, Orchard, Newton, Bukit Timah, and we have the rest of central region, which is the city fringe, and then you see the OCR, which is in grey, all right? So, if you can see, CCR, we have altogether five districts, RCR, we have nine districts, and OCR, we have 14 district. So what are the district you should go into or what are the region that you should go into? All right. So if today you are a buyer, first time buyer or investor, of course you will know that CCR will definitely has a higher PSF as compared to RCR, right? Because CCR is call central, RCR is city fringe. And obviously OCR, you know, you have a lower PSF, a lower entry price comparatively. All right, so if today you want to, you have a, a, a I would say like a limited budget, or for example, all right, you have, uh, have this particular budget, where should you go in for? All right, so let us take a look at the performance of each region. All right, so of course, as you can see, this is again, this is the last 15 or 16 years of our property price index, all right based on market, different market segment. The blue color is in, C, the blue color reflects CCR, the orange color reflect the RCR movement, and the gray color reflect the OCR price index. All right, of course we can see the pre-subprime crisis day, property prices went up and down, almost back to the same. 
and then go back up again. So from this period between, I would say like between 2007 or 2008 down to 2009, and from 2009 to maybe onwards, you realize that probably OCR kind of like dropped the least, all right, but kind of like increased the most, all right. And then, you know, uh, RCR is pretty stable, also dropped the same as CCR and increased more than CCR, for example, based on this chart. But what about the more recent one when it's affected by the cooling measure? All right, so the cooling measure, of course, we experienced a hike in quarter three, 2013, bottoming in quarter two, 2017. So you can see basically all three segments are affected. And after that, the bottoming of quarter two, 2017, all three segments seems to go up as well. All right, but at a different pace, of course. So if you look closely, you will see that, okay, OCR seems to, I mean, every region is affected, but OCR seems to affect least slightly, all right, at 10 point. 1%. But from quarter two until right now, right, it seems like it is having a, a better growth rate across you know, all these three regions. Right? I would say that, you know, of course, this is just from a broader region perspective. We haven't even zoomed down into specific district yet. Right? But if today, you know, you have a limited budget, for example, all right? then you are a first-time investor, right? So then, you know, maybe you want to be a little bit more conservative, right? So I would say that maybe OCR region is something that you can then what consider, right? Basically, you have a lower PSF entry price, right? At the same time, based on the past transaction is that OCR seems to drop the lease, all right? And goes up more, all right? So it's a more resilient market. And what about the unsold level for each region? All right, CCR having a unsold supply of 7,714 out of the five district combined. And RCR is 10,000. And OCR, as you can see, with a combined of 14 district, you only have an unsold supply of 8,000. All right, I would say that, you know, it's really kind of low in terms of the unsold supply. All right, if you look closely into the demand of the, of the past three or even of the past whole year, you realize that OCR demand is also very healthy. So at the unsold level of 8,500 is really not a lot. All right, so what about the upcoming supply that is coming in? All right, please take a look at the star portion. The star portion is the one that has not factor into the unsold supply chart, and right? the earlier one that I've shown you. All right, so if you look at that, in the red color, uh, red color, right, it's under OCR. So you can see OCR, basically, uh, if you look at that, one, two, three, four, five, you only have five upcoming supply, all right? And RCR, you will also, you will have about four, all right? And CCR, you have three, all right? But basically, you only need to add on if I compare to the earlier slot, for example, 8,559, all right, you only need to add in another 610. So that means around 9,000 more uh, in terms of the sub unsold supply, all right? So because this tool has not been factored in, all right? So as you can see, all right, typically when the land is launched and when the land is then sold, the land is not launched for sale immediately, all right? Take a look at Clementi Avenue 1. Right, which is of course we all know by now it's called Kavon, right? The upcoming new launch, all right, in that's happening in District Five, all right, in somewhere around November, right? So you can see the land was already won more than one year ago. Okay, more than one year ago, all right. So but it will only launch right now November. So it's about one and a half days later. So you can take a look at Canberra for example, Parcel A, Parcel B, same thing, all right. March twenty twenty. Highly likely, you only launch minimally, I think, at least close to March next year or even later, let's say maybe quarter two. So it's not an immediate thing. So as you can see, you know, the launches probably for the Tanamera, which of course yesterday we did know the new pricing of the Tanamera area, right? So this is not going to be launched probably until maybe say 2022, right? So it takes a while 
for the supplies all right, to come in to the market. So you can be see that you know, the supply is not really a lot. All right? And in fact, if the demand continues to be happening at the same pace, definitely we will be in a under very much under supply situation. It will be a seller's market already. Right? So if today you know that OCR is a little bit more resilient, all right, and you know that the supply level in the OCR region is also low, all right, the unsold supply is also low, then what are the opportunities, you know, that you can take advantage of in OCR, all right? So later on, I will share with you a lot more. And do you know that, you know, back in the concept plan 1991, all right, Singapore has already has planned to decentralize the CBD to the OCR region, all right? Which are the district or which are the area, basically, they are, looking and decentralize it as a regional hub too. Right? Of course, for the West, just to let you know, is Jurong East is the one that is designated to be the hub for the West because it's near to the second link. All right? Woodland is designated as the North portion because it's near to the first causeway, the, uh, near first causeway link. And the East is Tampanese because it's near to the Changi Airport. All right? So, Back in 1991, they have this basically concept plan already, all right? And of course, as you can see, you know, uh, things are getting more and more bustling. And in fact, there's a newspaper article talking about COVID-19 will likely speed up the shift to decentralized CBD, all right? And let us take a closer look because if today you want to invest, you know, in uh, Singapore property, and being an open economy, an open housing option, right? not just for Singaporean, but also for foreigners to come in and invest. Right? Basically, it's tagged to what? It's tagged to the economic activities. Right? If today you want to look at OCR region, you probably will also want to look at the regional hub region right? because these are the ones that have a lot of um, economic activities that's happening out there. So if today you're buying in as an investment, you will know that you know, it's, it is a lot easier for you to rent it out because there's a lot of work opportunity and people typically would want to stay near their workplace. And if you want to resell it, definitely there will be a resale market because same thing, people would want to stay near their workplace. So this, all right, orange color, it's, it refers to the industrial estate and the business park. The green color is the Institute of Higher Learning and the business note is the in blue color. So if you can see, if I break down into quadrants, all right, the first quadrant over here, second quadrant, third quadrant, fourth quadrant at the bottom right corner, you'll realize that Tampanese seems to have a lot more economic all right, business notes as compared to the rest of the other two regional hubs. All right, so if today you want to invest in a more resilient region, if you want to invest in the regional center, all right, and not just a central area, but you want to re invest in the regional center, maybe you can consider investing in Tampanese or Woodland or Jurong Lake District. So I will point out the historical track record. So basically, if you can see, the one that I box it up in blue are the regional center. Of course, Pongo Digital District is being added in you know, uh, and the performance is being tracked for the last seven years. Right? So you can see between the OC, within the OCR, the regional hub, all right, Tampanese seems to be a little bit more outstanding because in the last 20 years, it has a much higher growth rate as compared to the rest of the regional hub. All right? And it quite closely linked to our annual GDP growth rate of 5.3% per annum in the last 20 years. This is in the last 20 years. So it's a very good long-term uh, track record, I would say. All right. And today, if you want to invest in, in the OCR region, in the regional hub region, all right, and what are the available options that you have? All right. If today you want to take a look at Jurong East, you don't have any upcoming one, as I showed you. No nope. Woodland, no nope as well. So only you will have this option in templates. And the good thing is that Tampanese, based on the last 20 years, it has also a much higher you know, um, returns, I would say, the growth rate. So if today 
you want to invest in, all right, basically you have two options. One is treasured companies and the other one is a tapestry. And of course, upcoming new developments will be an easy. If today you are you do already own a private development, a private condo, uh, there are some restrictions right, that don't allow you to you know, buy an EC unless you sell away your private development. All right? So these are some of the uh, restrictions that's for EC. All right? So otherwise, you only have treasured companies and the tapestry to consider if you want to invest in the OCR region and regional hub. And so let us look a little bit more in detail in treasure at Tampanese. So treasure at Tampanese, this is how it looks like. And I want to share with you why it is attractive to look at treasure at Tampanese. All right, why? Because the land cost is pretty low and you have uh, the right entry price. Because if you look at the land cost, it's only at 676 PSF per plot ratio. And the good thing is that it was sold in the much earlier days of the M block place, all right, it was so way back in 2017. Right? In fact, in order to cool down the M block, the government has actually increased the development charges. So based on this particular research report, all right, an increase in the development charges will also cause the break-even price to go up higher. So this is like an estimate break-even price for treasured templates. It is expected to be at around 1204 uh, estimate uh, based on the DBS research report. Why this is important? Because when you know the land cost, you know the break even cost. And when you know the break even cost, then you will know what is the expected selling cost based on the profit margin that the developer wants to price it in. All right? If you have studied, if you have analyzed enough, you realize that typically for developer, all right, their profit margin are typically between the 25% to the 30% mark. All right. And how much is treasure at Tampany selling? All right. Based on this latest information, treasure at Tampany's is selling on an average price at 1,361. So what does this mean? All right. It means that it is selling at less than 15% profit margin. Of course, you might say that it's a business decision, but this business decision for the developer seems like, eh, you know, a good one because typically the developer profit margin is around 25 to 30, 30%. In fact, if today the dev any development that is pricing below 20%, I would advise my client to grab it already because you are buying it at a very close to the break-even price. All right, and let us take a look because maybe it's a business decision of the developer, right? Maybe it's not in line with the rest of the other development, right? Let us take a look, all right? So the price check, okay? So basically for treasure at Tampanese, at the land cost of 676, you take a look at 1361 PSF, all right? Same, all right? The next one, Tapestry, it has a lower land cost, right? And yet at the same time, it's also selling at the same price roughly. Right, so that means what? That means the profit margin all right, for tapestry is a little bit higher. Right? What about Park Botania? It's even higher as well. So you can see all right, that when you, if you buy treasure at Tampanese, all right, you will enter into more closer to a break-even price as compared all right, to the other um, two developments as I've shown you. All right? But of course, you can continue to research more and I'll show you. These are just one of the checks, all right? The other checks I want to point out to you is that, remember the earlier part where I show you the medium market PSF price for CCR, RCR, and OCR. So you can see OCR, the medium price is around, for third quarter is around 1523. So if today you want to buy into a regional hub in an OCR, you're not buying at medium or higher than the medium price. You're actually entering into below the medium price. So price check wise, it's already very safe. First, you know, you're buying at low cost, almost at the break even price. Secondly, you're buying lower than the medium of the whole OCR region, All right? Third price check. If today you miss out treasured companies, what are the other opportunities that you might have in upcoming OCR developments, right? Basically, I pull out, these are the balanced OCR development that is yet to launch, okay? Yeah, so these are the price 
on the uh, most right corner, all right? But you can see that these are the price, but it's not the final price. Why? Remember, July 2018, the, the government has actually introduced a non remissible 5% ABSD on the development. So meaning the land cost, you should add additional 5%. So once I factor that in, you'll realize that if today, all the developments having the same business decision as the at Simlian, all right, for treasure at Tampanese, all right, everyone wants to price it only at around 10 to 15% profit margin. Then the selling price, all right, I mean, the only, constant is based on you will want to check on the land price so if the land price is lower with the same profit margin definitely the selling price will be lower right so if today you miss out on treasure at templates what are the options that you have available basically you will have an option to buy a lower price than treasure templates right phoenix high where is phoenix high is at district 23 which is at bukit panjang there all right and in fact even for Canberra, in between Isha and Sembawang, it's already at the same price. And going forward, you basically don't have any other OCR developments that is having a lower land price than treasured companies. Right? So that means if you miss out on these treasured companies, you probably have to pay more all right, for other uh, location already in the OCR region. All right. What about comparatively with EC? Why I want to compare with EC? Right? Basically, we all know, right? EC, when you buy, is like kind of like make money. Why? Because you're buying a Lexus at a Toyota price. And so it's, 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 that, that's how what one of the ministers has said. So it's like you make you buy EC, it's like sure make money. Okay? So what about treasure at companies comparing with an EC land price? Right? If you can see, Basically, uh, the prices over here all right, are quite closely related to treasure at Tampanese land cost. Same thing, if everyone has the same business decision on the profit margin, then we are, when you purchase at treasure at Tampanese, you know that you are purchasing something that is very close to the EC price. And I want to point out to you is that, for example, at treasure at Tampanese, all right, versus another Tampanese development, Park Central Residence, that's upcoming. So you will know that it's only a price gap of 10%. All right, and typically for EC land, or rather EC selling price and private condo selling price, usually there's a price gap of 20 to even 30%. So if today the land cost is only 10% price gap, uh, then it is something you know, for you to take advantage of, right? Because you all know that EC has kind of a lot of restriction in place before you can enjoy that so-called that special price. So for EC, you need to fulfill the MOP, all right? And after MOP, you, you make sure that it's 10 years after the TOP, then you can sell it to a foreigner. So you have some timeline and sometimes time is money as well. So by investing in treasured companies, you are buying in at a very low profit margin. That's first safety price share. Secondly, you're buying close to an EC price without the EC restriction, all right? You buy time, all right? And thirdly, if you miss out on treasured companies, the other pricing in the OCR region is definitely much higher as well, all right? So this is something that you might want to consider, all right? Seriously consider. The region is good. The entry price is good. What about the location of this development? Right? This location of this development, as you can see at the bottom of your screen, all right, we are near to what? We are near to three MRTs, all right, as we point out. Right? Tampanese MRT over here, Simi MRT. Actually, Simi MRT is the nearest, which is about six to seven minutes walk. All right? And Tampanese is about 14 minutes walk. And you have another Tampanese West MRT right at your uh, left side of the screen. All right? And not just that, you have a lot of shopping mall nearby. All right, you have three shopping malls in the Tampanese area. You have one over at CMA site. You have a, altogether five if you include our Tampanese hub. All right, if you don't want to walk to the Tampanese regional center, all right, you basically have a 24 hours NTUC fair price right at your doorstep. And also this famous Rao Market, right? There's a lot of coffee shop as well. So basically it's 
if amenities is really very, very convenient. And if you drive, you are just next to the expressway. All right. So there will be a new route called Tampines Lane that will connect you to the expressway. All right. So within five minutes, you'll reach Changi Airport. Within 20 minutes, you will reach uh, the CBD area. And the good thing is that if you look at this map right now, all right, this is more than a 500 meter mark. Right? If you look at the map right now, you don't find any private development. Right? So this is one and only over here. And this is important because I want to point out to you is that maybe you would like to think which other private developments is next to amenities. Maybe have, but what about next to amenities and don't have any other competition, no other private developments within 500 meter radius and also within walking distance to three MRT stations. And he has a direct and quick access to expressway without traffic light. And of course, lastly, you are in a town where you have a lot of shopping mall. You have three shopping mall side by side. All right, so which are the locations that you can think in Singapore fulfill all these five attributes? All right, so I, I, I honestly, I cannot think of any asset property treasure. So this is, this is really important because you have this positive attribute that can stand out, right? that can able to attract tenants, that can actually attract the secondary market in the future. Right? So these are some of the uh, latest artist impression of the facilities. And we even have a concierge, by the way. Right? Concierge is typically in the district 9, 10, 11, the core central region. So you don't see it in OCR. So this is something different and it's just stands out, all right? And you look at the huge amount of space, for example, in a culinary studio, in a play studio, in a co-working space, the reading room, etc. All right? And these are all made available for all the 2,200 units. Yes, all right? When I say 2,200 units, you probably have this kind of facial expression, all right? But I want to show it to you is that, do you know that the land size is also very big? Right? It's almost as big as an 11 football field and 60% of the land is zoned for landscaping. So if you take the land divided by the number of units, you'll realize that it has actually a much lower density than most of the new developments. All right? And only 60% of the land, uh, only 40% of the land is used for the unit. 60% of the land is actually for landscaping and communal facilities. So to me, I find that scarcity of a development with many positive attributes is actually more important than the number of units in the development. Let's say you are really concerned about the number of units in the development, right? When was the last mega development in Singapore? Of course, it's in Dilliden, all right? So let us take a look at Dilliden, all right? Dilliden is over here. Next to it is Liden Residence, and in front of it is Spanish Village, all right? there is no impact on the transaction volume, I would say. It doesn't mean that you have more units, means it's harder to resell it in the future. No, basically, the, because of the positive attributes, you basically have more people looking at the development than any other thing else, all right? So basically, uh, I pull out the last three years, 2020, it's from January to September, right? So as you can see, comparing between these three developments that is kind of like side by side. All right. I don't think you have an issue. In fact, probably you might have a more transaction that's happening. All right. In terms of the percentage, it's also very healthy. All right. So there isn't any issue of reselling in the market. The more important thing is that whether it has more positive attributes or not. All right. And I want to repoint out to you again is that you will see this within 500 meter radius, you're not having any private competitor. As compared to the earlier slide, you realize that for Faroe Road region, right, it's typically built in a cluster. All right, so these are just one of the comparison. And the other comparison that's happening in Tampines, again, same thing, you have a cluster of private housing. I'm sure when you want to resell it, your buyer or your tenant don't just view only one development they will view the development that is next to it as well to just make a comparison, all right? So definitely, if you look at that, easily you'll be more than 4,500 units, even in the Tampines West area. Right? So at 2002, I'm sure it is 
very much lesser, all right, as compared to this. And the other thing is also in parseries, all right, also around about 4,500 units of cluster. So you can see typically private developments are built in a cluster, all right. So by just having this one and only within this 500 or 600 meter radius, all right, basically, all right, that you will command that kind of rental rate, that kind of um, demand in the future. And the beautiful part, as I show you, the location, it is so close to amenities. And if you drive in future, this is the new road where it connects you to the expressway, all right? And one thing is that you have many different exits. Right? So basically, you have two main entrance and exit point, all right? On your left, you can turn up to the expressway. On the right, you go to the Tampines West. And the other uh, main entrance, you can go to the Tampines Central. So there's a lot of um, movement, you know, that you can actually drive to. All right, and the other thing is this, right? You get to enjoy more facilities, right? So treasure at Tampines, because of the large landscaping, you enjoy a higher, a double facilities as compared to a typical development. And the good thing is that make a guess about the maintenance fee. The maintenance fee is only a mere $150 onwards. All right, so even if you go for a five bedroom today, your monthly maintenance fee is only at 240. So that is the beauty of economy of skill, where you enjoy more facilities and at the same time, you pay lesser. And the good thing is that the entry price, it's also very, very attractive. So let me quickly summarize what is so attractive about treasure companies. All right, so today, Treasure at Tampines is a new, brand new development. And as a brand new development, as an investor or as an aspiring home upgraders, you reduce your capital outlay because it's on progressive payment schedule. Secondly, you take advantage of the current low interest rate. When it's progressive payment schedule, your monthly installment all right, at a low interest rate, you also reduce the outstanding principal amount faster, remember? So it's a win-win situation. And the other thing is that you are investing in a resilient region, all right? And you're also investing in a regional hub with a very good 20 year track record and a very good proxy to the current and future economic activities. And you are in the right location, not just in the region, all right? But also the location of this development as well. And most, most importantly, you are going in at a very safe and right entry price, all right? Within the region itself, it's already lower than the median price. You are entering into a quite near to the break-even price and then at the same time, uh, low, uh, low entry price as compared to the other region in Singapore as well, all right? So if you are excited, then let me share with you a little bit more on treasure at Tampines, right? on the different layout and the floor plans. In fact, if you zoom in closely, right, you will know that the floor plan is a lot more efficient right, as compared to some of the other newer developments. Right? I, want, I, 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 can't, I don't have enough time to go through all the, the 33 different floor plans, but I'll just go in, zoom in a few ones that I think you can seriously uh, consider. And I think it's quite interesting as well. All right. So first and foremost is our two bedroom plus study. All right, our two bedroom and study, it's actually at 63 square meter. All right, it is down to the last 17 units already. In fact, I have been saying this for quite some time already, but I thought this is really a very uh, efficient layout. Why I say so? Because you can see this kitchen over here, it neatly tucked into one side, and there's a chance for you to actually enclose it in the future. Right. How does an uh, enclosed kitchen looks like? It looks like this. All right, we, de we get an interior designer to design and it's really quite modern and it doesn't cost a lot. It's just $3,000 and you possibly can have an enclosed kitchen in the future. But what I want to point out to you is that it is very efficient layout. Why I say so? All right, Alps Residence, for example, all right, it's also a Tampines development, a new brand new development that 
was TOP last year, late last year. All right, so you can see they have two bedroom plus study. All right, it's at 64 square meter. I hope you can see yeah? 64 square meter. Whereas treasure at Tamil is 63. So you can see two bedrooms, one bathroom, and one study. All right, same thing it goes for tapestry, right, which is along that Tampines Avenue 10. Same thing, 64 square meter, two bedroom, one bathroom, one study area. But do you know that for treasure, we have two bedroom, two bathroom, and one study. So you see, a smaller size, 63 square meter, yeah, one square meter smaller, but yet we have two bedroom, two bathroom instead of one. And, we, and yet we also have the study area. And at the same time, we possibly can also enclose this kitchen. So you can see how thoughtful this developer is. All right. It's not just by selling it to you at the right selling price, but at the same time, it creates this layout to make sure that it fills up a gap in the market, in the Tampanese market. Because if today you want to resell it in the future, all right, people who want to go for a study area, all right, and they want a two bedroom. Right? They have to accept that it is a one bathroom. But today, Treasure at Tampanese, you have this option of giving them two bathrooms. Right? So you fill in a gap and indirectly create a kind of demand for you so that in future, if you want to sell it, you can sell it at a higher price. All right? So you will buy at a very attractive entry price and yet at the same time, you can resell it at a higher price. And we're not just talking about better location. We're just also talking about efficient good layouts all right so this is really very very thoughtful and the other thing i want to point out is our three bedroom and if you can see closely all right our three bedroom is at 96 square meter all right what's so special about this is that you can see we have a very comfortable dining and living area you can see the width is about 3.2 meter in width size typical new development is about 2.6 to 2.8 so you can see it's wider and is bigger. So you have a more spacious living and a dining. And the other thing I want to point out is that for the room size, look at the master, it's at 13 square meter. You see this, you can comfortably put a queen size bed. At the same time, over here, you see this space over here, you can comfortably put in a baby cot as well. So this is, this is important. Why I say so? Because three bedrooms are typically for a family. And especially so if maybe you have a young family, you have a growing family, and you want to have your kids to co-sleep with you during the growing up, initial growing up years. So this is a very useful space. All right, so for, for treasure at Tampines, the developer is very, very thoughtful. They, they actually make the area very efficient. They have a quite very spacious living and dining. At the same time, their room size, especially for the master, it's really very very uh, wonderful for families, all right? And the price only starts from 1.354. It's only at 1,311 pence. So, so it's really very, very attractive. And if you have read the news, all right, because COVID, right? <laughs> During the circuit breaker, a lot of us, we cannot go out in the two months. So we are all at home, you know, we have to work from home. So it is after that we realized that wow we really need a, a additional room you know to, to become our office or you know or additional room for the kids for example so it is it is like that that's the reason why one of the reason for an increase in demand is because there's a lot of buyers out there they want to right size their home all right so by by doing this you have this option over here in treasure why i say so you see this is the best selling project list the top 10 list happening in august 2020 so you can see treasure at Tampines is at a very attractive medium pricing of 1364 right you take a look at the other ocr prices all right park calamities for example is at 1006 so it's a 300 psf get ready all right, so it's almost close to like a 300,000 price gap. All right, so if you can see if today, I want to talk about RCR also, or it's like 1,008 or 1,009, you know? So what, what it means that treasure do allows you to upsize your house for better comfort. If today you are someone that is looking at the two bedroom, you can potentially, you know, buy a three bedroom in treasure at companies, all right? And you can, have an additional room, probably 
you know, to, to, to put in your kids or to have what a workstation work from home and things like that. Right? So you do have this option. And interestingly, we have this three bedroom type C6. All right, if you really like the spaciousness of our living and the dining, and you like the spaciousness of the master, I think this is really wonderful for you, right? Because for a two bedroom, right, typically you do not need to have an enclosed kitchen. So this layout for three bedroom is our three bedroom classic. It doesn't have an enclosed kitchen, but it does have this additional three, three rooms that you will enjoy and a spacious living and a master. And the other thing is that if you really, really want to enclose this kitchen, there's a possibility of doing that, all right? So same thing, we get an interior design to design such. So you can see it's really a very modernized design to it, all right? And same thing, if you today you have the budget of a three bedroom, you can potentially look at four bedroom over here in Treasure Tampanese. All right, you take a look at the room size. It's like 10 square meter, all right? It's really very comfortable because typical uh, bedroom size for new launches are typically from eight to about nine square meter, all right? Or 8.9. So at 10 square meter, it's really, really very comfortable. And lastly, I really want to point out to you is that Treasure has this five bedroom, which is very rare in Tampanese, all right? Less than 50 units or five bedrooms are in Tampanese right now, all right? So for Treasure, over here, you have 160 square meter in terms of the size. You take a look, probably the nearest competitor is Santorini. You have 128 square meter. So you look at the difference in size, all right? So obviously, you know, Treasure, the five bedroom, it's a lot more spacious and very comfortable, and you can get it at slightly above 2 million, all right? And in future, there's a shortage of five bedroom in Tampanese. And if you want to stay, if your parents or family, if you have really have a lot of kids as well, you know, really these are very good options for you. And I hope, you know, you are really very excited to visit, you know, our, our show flat right now. All right. So our show flat is by uh, appointment basis. All right. And the good news is that right now the developer is giving you this current discount a price. All right. For two bedroom, you get a direct additional discount of 4,000 all the way to 10,000 for five bedrooms, all right? So do kindly make appointment with our ERA agent, right, that invited you today, all right? And if you are so excited, all right, you can't wait to see the show flat, we also have this virtual link where you can actually view it at your own home comfort, all right? So, uh, of course, not forgetting, uh, do also take a look at our the rest of our 140 newly launched property and these are the uh, QR code that you can actually um, take a look. Uh, so with that, I would like to uh, end my session today. I hope you find it very fruitful and you know what to look out for in your property uh, investment journey. All right, so anyone has any question before I end my session? Kelvin, thank you very much for your wonderful sharing today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Yeah, if you have any question, you can always private uh, send uh, us your trusted EIA agent. They are well pleased to answer you as soon as possible. Uh, Kelvin, you have anything to add on? Uh, I think I'm all good. If nothing, I'm going to have an ending speech. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you everyone for attending the ERA Property Weekend 2020. Before you log off, please write now the link, address, or scan the QR code to the Singapore's largest virtual sales gallery. Then you can enjoy the immersive virtual experience that offers 360 showcases in stunning details anytime, anywhere you are. Check out all the newly launched projects across the island and enjoy your limited time offers this weekend. Book your personal virtual tour with any of your YA trusted advisors, as well as all standing by to serve you. Finally, as this webinar has been broadcast live on official YA and the Project Marketing Facebook pages, do help us like and comment on the post and create a watch party of your own 
so that more people will get known about this incredible event. With that, see you around again. Thank you very everyone. Bye bye. Thank you everyone. Bye bye. Thanks, Kelvin. Thanks, Wendy. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye. Rely on you to make your dreams come true. That's why we take pride in what we do, and we do it all just for you. With your spirit and your trust, you place your future with us. That's why we're here to lend a hand and finally make you our friend. First in spirit, first in pride, first to be the one to make dreams come alive, first in service, first for you, first to be the one to really do it all for you. Together we will come to break new lands. The power's in our hands Together let us walk the way to success To be the first and the ultimate best First in spirit First in pride First to be the one to make dreams come alive First in service First for you, first to be the 